What's it take to be number one? You'll find out this week on Motoring 2006. TSN's Motoring 2006 is brought to you by the new Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses. This was the scene last year as we introduced Motoring's Car of the Year for 2005, the Chrysler 300. Where has the time gone? Because here we are once again at the Docks Entertainment Center on the waterfront in downtown Toronto, preparing to pull the wraps off the best in class for 2006. And doing the honours this year will be Jennifer Bond, who was crowned Miss Swimsuit Canada in 2006, and Julie Hinton, who wore the crown in 2004. We will also be hearing from you, our viewers, as our nominees have been listed on the motoring website, giving you a chance to vote. You know, the whole motoring gang is here, Jim Kenzie, and you don't want to miss Bill Gardner in a bow tie. And of course, the man behind the wheel every week on Test Drive, Mr. Graham Fletcher. And Graham, it is a privilege that we have every year to drive the brand new cars and trucks. Some years it's easy to pick a winner, yeah. some years not so easy. How would you rate the class of 06? The class of 06 is probably the most difficult since we started doing the Car of the Year show. In previous years, for instance last year, there was a whole bunch of cars that just yelled, pick me, pick me. The 300C, it was head and shoulders above anything else in any other category, so it was an obvious winner. This year, just getting them down to the final three cars was a problem. Then we had to start splitting hairs to come up with the eventual winners. It really was very difficult. What we're going to do over the next hour, we'll have our category winners, and the winners of the categories will be eligible for the best vehicle overall in 06. Now, the first category is economy, and you know, Graham, with rising fuel prices, this is a pretty big segment these days. It's getting more and more important. You know, a few years ago, if you bought an economy car, it was cheap to buy, but it was more importantly cheaply built. Marginal power, iffy materials, and if you got a steering wheel, you were lucky. The three in this year's economy car category, well, they rewrite the rule book. While different in subtle ways, the new Hyundai Accent and Kia Rio share just about everything, especially the items beneath their shiny sheet metal. In both cases, this means more space, more refinement, much better content, and better power. Both also take a big step forward in terms of handling without completely giving up ride comfort. The bottom line, if you want a handsome hatchback, pick the Kia Rio. If you need a sensible sedan, the Accent is the answer. The Yaris replaces the Echo hatchback in Toyota's small car portfolio. In 2000, we recognized the Echo's contribution by awarding it our economy car of the year. Back then, the shortcoming was the rather cramped cabin. The Yaris addresses this in spades. Not only is it 35mm wider, 25mm taller, the length and wheelbase both jump by a substantial 90mm which makes a tremendous difference. Add to this better power and handling and you have a strong contender. Redesigning a car is all about taking risks, especially if the car in question is one of the industry's accepted benchmarks. The latest version of the Civic succeeds as Honda took a good car and made it better in every area. More room, nicer materials, better handling and it earns 140 horsepower while delivering better fuel economy and lower emissions. Talk about having a cake and eating it too. For this combination of reasons, the Civic picks up our best new economy car for 2006. GM, for some reason, decided to mark the speedometer in odd numbers, i.e. 70, 90 and 110. When will they ever get together on this thing is beyond me. <laughs> I got lost, I'm sorry. Hop in, Brad. Holy <laughs> Graham, you almost killed me for crying out loud. <laughs> sorry, I'll try that again. Come on, Graham, it's time for... <laughs> <laughs> Come on! <laughs> Hold on a sec. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jackie Stewart. It's a great day for motoring 89 and for motor racing too.
We're back at the Docks Entertainment Center in Toronto. It won't be long before Julie and Jennifer will be pulling the rafts off motoring's overall car of the year for 2006. We'll also find out who you, the viewers, have selected. Let's now join Graham for our nominees in our next category. Our next category is Family Sedan. Now you may say, what the heck is a Family Sedan? Aside from the obvious, for us on motoring, it's something that lies between the economy car and the entry-level sports sedan. Now in this particular instance, the cars that make up that category, well, they're one tough bunch. The Chevy Impala has long been one of GM's better and certainly more popular choices. The latest version takes all the likeable traits and ratchets them up a notch, or three. It's better looking, has even more comfort than before, and it now rides and handles with the best the class has to offer. It also continues to bring Made in Canada quality to the table, which is worth its weight in gold. Having ignored the car side of its business for way too long, Ford is turning up the heat with the new Fusion. It has some semblance of personality, has adequate power, although more would be better, and it handles better than just about any other front drive family sedan. Hardly surprising as it rides on a stretched and strengthened version of the Mazda 6 platform. Indeed, the Fusion is good enough to put Ford back on the map. Hyundai can lay claim to inventing the original disposable car, the Pony. The new Sonata will forever put this horrible memory behind the company. Not only does the latest Sonata have road presence, power and decent handling on its side, it comes with a ton of standard equipment for an affordable buck. As soon as consumer perception catches up with the reality of the new Hyundai, the Sonata is going to sell like hotcakes. The winner of the family car under $35,000 is the Hyundai Sonata. We'll unveil our car of the year in a few minutes time, but you know, if there were an award for the car making country of the year, it would have to go to Korea. Now we've known for some time that the Koreans are building pretty good cars, but it seems just in the last year or so the general public has figured it out too. They're no longer just cars you have to buy because they're all you can afford. The Hyundai Sonata, the Hyundai Azera, now there's a $35,000 Korean built car that you might actually want to own. And in the lower ends, of course, the Hyundai Accent and the Kia Rio, very impressive cars. Even the remnants of the Daewoo organization, well, they're no longer building cars under their own label, but for Chevrolet, Pontiac, and Suzuki, they're doing a really good job. Now, is this year's Car of the Year Korean? Well, you're just going to have to stay tuned and find out. You know, earlier we looked at the family car, but you know, Graham, today's boomer generation are quickly becoming empty nesters. They still want four doors, they've got some cash in their pocket, and they're looking for a sportier look. Absolutely, and you know, this year was an absolute bumper crop, but the best part of all, the horsepower has been going up and up and up over the years, and this year, well, it was just extreme. So there was so many choices this year, rather than try and whittle three out of such a large crowd, we split it right down the middle. Those sports sedans under $40,000 and those over. The Mazda Speed 6 demonstrates what happens when you take a well-balanced family sedan and slide a serious engine under the hood. Turbocharging Mazda's direct injection 2.3 litre Ford delivers 274 stallions and a ton of torque. Let's just say it makes for a blindingly quick ride. However, unlike many souped-up cars, the Mazda 6 remains as drivable as the garden variety vehicle that picked up our car of the year two years ago. While the suspension is much stiffer, it doesn't beat the riders up. Add to that a lavish interior and you have a delightfully sporty sedan. Subaru's WRX has earned itself quite a reputation since its introduction. To make things better, the 2.0-litre engine and its rather peaky performance has been replaced with a larger 2.5-litre engine that spreads its 230 horsepower out over a much broader range. Add to that a more aggressive exterior look, a nicer interior, and Subaru's excellent all-wheel drive system, and you have a significantly better car. For those where enough is never quite enough, there's always the STI. Its 300 stallions manages to make the WRX look like a rather pedestrian vehicle. After years of neglect, the VW GTI is back with a vengeance. Not only is it bigger, meaning there's a usable back seat, upping the size has not robbed the new car of its highly tossable charm. Likewise, dropping in an Audi-derived 2.0-litre turbocharged engine gives the car the urgency it has always demanded. 
Better yet, as the 200 horsepower and 207 pound feet of torque arrive minus turbo lag, the sweetness is always at the driver's beck and call. Now this is particularly true when the engine is married to VW's direct shift manual gearbox. This thing is good enough to make Michael Schumacher envious. The sports sedan under 40k, the Subaru WRX and its cousin, the STI. The latest A4 is without question the best to date. Along with a sure-footed ride which is delivered by the Quattro all-wheel drive system and an advanced electronic stability control system comes a new engine. The 3.2 litre FSI V6 pumps out 255 horsepower and 243 pound-feet of torque. Factor in the best manumatic on the market, Audi's 6-speed Tiptronic transmission, and you have the makings of a very strong contender. The A4 runs to 100 km an hour in 7.5 seconds and bridges the 80 to 120 gap in 6 flat. Redesigning the accepted benchmark is a touchy proposition, with the latest 3 Series BMW did not get it wrong. There is more space and yet the car loses none of its dynamic charm. Indeed, the optional active steering system is the best in any car at any price. The new 3 also has a delightful interior and a silky smooth 3 litre inline 6 that pushes 255 horsepower. This, when made it to the 6 speed manual box, means a 6.4 second run to 100 km an hour and an 80 to 120k time of 5 seconds flat. The previous generation IS was a bit of a snore to drive. The latest version writes all the wrongs as it now has best in class power. With 306 horsepower and 277 pound feet of torque, it is seriously fast whenever the pedal is matted. As for the hard numbers, the IS350 runs to 100k in 5.6 seconds and blasts between 80 and 120k in 4.7. The IS also boasts a very comfortable driving environment, plush materials and all the mod cons expected of a serious sports sedan. Our best new sports sedan over $40,000 is BMW's new 3 Series. We're back at the Docks Entertainment Center on the shores of Lake Ontario. Inside, Jennifer and Julie are preparing to unveil our best overall vehicle for the year 2006. Let's once again join Graham for our next category. Few things in life are as much fun as driving a sports coupe down a twisty back road. This year's three nominees, well, every single one of them would make a worthy winner. In the end, there really was only one choice. Once the darling of the tuner crowd, the Civic Si seemed to lose its direction. While it was still fast and fun to drive, there was more than a little ho-hum to its personality. The latest version is so good it returns the excitement to the fastest Civic ever. A better chassis and suspension gives the new 2.0-litre engine and its 197 horsepower a much better place to showcase its lovable charms. Add to this an attractive interior and an exterior design that now has some authority and you have the best Civic Si to date. If you want bold, you need look no further than the Mitsubishi Eclipse. The look, especially when painted a resmi orange, turns heads wherever it roams. The Eclipse GT also earns a healthy 263 horsepower and 260 pound-feet of torque. The result is rapid throttle response and a very good impersonation of how a small displacement V8 feels when it's punched just about anywhere up the rev range. The drawback? Well, the GT's V6 engine puts just too much mass over the front wheels, and so terminal understeer is never too far away. How do you top the best Corvette ever? Simple, bring out the latest version of the Z06. 
This thing is nothing short of extraordinary. From its carbon fiber fenders to its 20 pad disc brakes, this car is a veritable world beater. The fact that there is a 500 horsepower engine under the hood only serves to underscore the obvious. However, nothing prepares you for the ride. Not only is it fast, getting to a metric ton in under four seconds, the handling is truly tedacious. Indeed, it takes much bigger cojones than mine to find out where the limit lies. Consequently, the Z06 wins the best new sports coupe in a landslide. You know, Graham, I couldn't agree more. The Z06, without a doubt, is the best bang for the buck on the highway today. But what I can't figure out is, General Motors can build such a hot car, why can't that passion trickle down into the rest of the lineup? Well, you know, in fairness to GM, I think what you're going to see in the future, they did a fabulous job with the C6 Corvette. The Z06 is a true world beater. Now, if they can take some of that essence, squeeze it into a jar, and then put a drop into all of their other products, things are going to get much better. Now, in fairness to GM again, the Cobalt SS is the first car where you're starting to see some of the Corvette rub off. And let's not forget the long-awaited Solstice, which Pontiac is taking dead aim at the Mazda MX-5. In fact, they're going head-to-head -head as our only two nominees for Convertible of the Year for 2006. Having had the affordable roads to market to itself for the past 15 or so years, Mazda could have carried on without paying any attention to what the competition was doing. Rather, it released the latest version of the Miata, which is now called the MX-5. It changes everything. It's bigger, has better power, a stiffer chassis, which banishes cowl shake, and it's lighter and has a much nicer interior. The one thing Mazda did not change, however, is the sheer fun of driving a car that feels like an overgrown go-kart. The Solstice is the first serious challenge the Miata has had to face. It brings 177 horsepower, a very chic interior, and it has a chassis and suspension that reads as though it's straight out of a tuna magazine. Double wishbones with coilover Bilstein shocks at all four corners, and massive 18-inch wheels with equally large 245-45 performance tires. Combine the attributes of the platform with the perfect 50-50 weight distribution front to rear, and you have a car that drives as nicely as it looks. This category boiled down to pure logic. The Solstice needs a six-speed manual and some semblance of a trunk. The Mazda MX-5, on the other hand, well, it's got both. End of story, and so the MX-5 wins our convertible of the year. They say you should be careful about what you wish for because you might just get it. Well, for years, I've been wishing that consumers would stop buying these stupid, useless vehicles, these SUVs. They weigh too much, they take up too much space, they use too much gas, and they're too dangerous. Well, guess what? People are finally starting to listen to me. Sales of the big units are plummeting. And what's the downside? Well, a lot of viewers of this show work for the companies that built those vehicles and they used to make a lot of money. Now, there's nothing wrong with making a lot of money, except all those huge profits concealed from the companies themselves the fact that the rest of their product lines were starting to drift off. They're no longer competitive. So small cars, family sedans, guess what? That's where the import brands are particularly strong. So particularly Ford and General Motors, you're going to have to prove to the market that you once again can become full-line manufacturers. We're only minutes away when Jennifer and Julie will unveil Motoring's overall best vehicle for the year 2006 here at the Docks Entertainment Center in Toronto. Let's join Graham. The nominees for our Luxury Car Award are all a little different and primarily because any single one of them, well, they could have won the sports sedan category. As it stands, let's take a look at three wonderful rides. As with all Daimler Chrysler's SRT cars, the Charger SRT8 stresses muscle. Gone is the stock 5.7 litre Hemi and its 340 horsepower in favour of a larger, much more powerful 6.1 litre lump. The difference this makes to performance is astounding. The stallion count rises to 425, while torque tops out at a tyre shredding 420 pound feet. 
The result is a car that does not have to take a back seat to any of its peers. It rips through 100k in 5.1 seconds, and when you map the gas at 80, you'd better be hanging on because it blasts through 120 in 4.5 seconds. As with the IS, the previous GS was a rather somnolent thing. The new car uses l Finesse, Lexus's new design language, to reverse the previous car's stylistic boredom. In a nutshell, it blends opposing values, bold and dynamic with unpretentious and elegant. In the case of the GS430, it all works rather nicely. Add to that a sweet 4.3-litre V8 that pushes a rewarding 300 horses and a slick-shifting six-speed manumatic, and you have a car that handles a twisty road as well as it does Bay Street. The first Infiniti M was a rather lame effort, essentially it was an old car with a new name. The latest car is a technical tour de force. Along with a throaty 335 horsepower V8 comes a slick shifting automatic with a manual mode, an active cruise control system that maintains both the set speed and distance behind the car ahead, active headlights that swivel into a corner to light the way in a brighter manner, and a lane departure warning system. Now if the driver begins to wander out of his lane, the car begins to beep. Motoring's best new luxury car for 2006 is the Dodge Charger SRT8. You know, I know I say it every year, but Graham, every year we seem to have a new segment which adds to confusion and even gets us confused. But I think the crossover segment is here to stay, but maybe at the detriment of the SUV. No, no, I disagree with that. Not that you ever agree with me well, anyway. But that's beside yeah. the point. Exactly. The large SUV, the full-size SUV, I think they will go the way of the dodo bird. The luxury units, I think there's room for them as well as there is for the mid-size and small SUVs. As for the crossovers, well, they're going to become a fact of life. In Europe, they were driven by the cost of fuel, and I think that's what's driving the crossover market in North America. And what our definition of a crossover is, it's a combination of sport utility, wagon, and minivan. All right, let's check out our nominees for the best crossover of the year 2006. When Bob Lutz, the brain behind the PT Cruiser, landed at GM, you knew a similar car had to be on the way. Enter the Chevrolet HHR. The PT and the HHR are about the same size, both stress flexibility and both have a retro look. However, blending the styling cues of a 50s Chevy Suburban with those of the outrageous SSR gives the Chevy more road presence than the Chrysler. The other big difference surfaces in the handling department. The HHR has a much more planted feel when pushed. Take a Mazda 3, stretch it and add a third row and you have the new Mazda 5, a car that's going to start a new trend in transportation. As with many vehicles with a third row, it's an either or proposition. You either use the back end for cargo or a couple of passengers. Where this car differs is that the third row seat is actually usable even for an adult. The other nice part is that in stretching the Mazda 5, they lost none of the 3's delightfully drivable charm. The 5 also has decent power and a comprehensive list of standard equipment. As with the Mazda 5, the B-Class is aimed at the young growing family. It will accommodate 6 in relative comfort or with the third row folded flat, almost as much cargo as a station wagon. Where it tends to come unraveled, however, is in the power department. The base model simply feels dull and lifeless. The turbocharged model counters this sensation, but at a cost. Not only at the time of purchase, but also for its thirst for premium fuel. Our best new crossover for 2006 is the Mazda 5. This vehicle is going to start a trend the industry is going to follow. I'm driving a $15,000 car these days. That's pretty much bottom end of the market. I wasn't that surprised that it had air conditioning because everybody wants air conditioning these days. It had power locks, it had remote central locking, but the thing that really struck me, it had heated seats in a $15,000 car. Now, it wasn't too long ago where you had to spend $35,000, $50,000 to get features like that. Nowadays you get ABS, you get electronic stability control, all cars costing under 20 grand. So then the question is, 
Why are we buying $50,000 cars if all that technology is available in cheap cars? Are we spending all that money simply to have a cool badge on the hood? Well, maybe it's working now, but I tell you, if I was a high-end car maker, I'd be looking over my shoulder. This is the time in the program when we normally join Bill Gardner at the Quaker State Mobile Garage. Bill is around here somewhere. And you know, this is the time of the year when we all get a chance to rant about the good, the bad, and the ugly in the car industry. And Bill's no different. So let's see what's on Bill's mind. Hey Brad, you guys might be inside, you might be warm, you're dry, you got the girls, you got the cars in there, but there's one thing you don't have, buddy. The tailgate. As far as I'm concerned, if it's no got a tailgate, it's crap. Pickup trucks are the best, we know that, right? Well, you know what? There's been some interesting technology coming along in the pickup truck segment. Some of it got here this year in 06. Uh, the Dodge Ram, for example, first ever pickup truck with cylinder deactivation. That thing will run on four cylinders. The Hemi V8 will run on four cylinders on the highway to save you fuel if you're easy on the throttle. So there's some big progress right there in terms of fuel economy. Next year, GM is coming out with six-speed automatics in their redesigned 07 full-size trucks, and they're coming out with some new base engines for those trucks as well. But you know what? The big three are growing their trucks bigger and bigger on every redesign. As soon as the Japanese caught up in the full-size truck segment, the big three trumped them with bigger and bigger trucks. They're really heavy, and you know what? When I was testing them, I noticed you can really feel the weight and the bulk. Now in the Dodge, the Hemi engine has got so much power, it actually makes the truck feel light on its feet. It's got that much snap to it. But if you get a little bit overzealous with the throttle, you come out of the cylinder deactivation, and there goes your fuel economy, just like it does in any other vehicle. So there's a good thing for you to remember always good driving habits will always save you on fuel no matter what kind of technology you're driving but you know what I'd like to see some of these vehicles lose a little bit of weight they're just getting too heavy now there's some manufacturers that have made some good progress and we need to take our hats off to them Subaru for example has uh, on their latest redesign on some of their cars saved some significant amount of weight by using aluminum in some of the panels the hood and the hatch covers uh, the hatch panels as well made out of aluminum and they've saved significant weight and you know what anytime you can save weight in a vehicle it's great but I've noticed a lot of sub assemblies in vehicles when I'm working on them they're made of plastic or aluminum now or a combination uh, of different lightweight materials and they save weight on these components but the bottom line still isn't there because they just keep adding equipment elsewhere and making the vehicle physically bigger so they lose those gains that they really could have had you know I'd really like to see somebody come out with a vehicle significantly lighter than the competition and, with, and reduce the engine size, go high tech on the engine, then you're going to see some real gains in the fuel economy. And you know what? With buck a liter fuel, somebody's got to do it. I'm sure it'll happen soon. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2006. All these things we've looked at this week are preventive maintenance. We're trying to catch problems before they develop into costly repairs. Next week, we're going to look closely at belts and hoses. Until then, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 88. We're back at the Docks Entertainment Center in Toronto. Julie and Jennifer are preparing to unveil our overall best vehicle for 2006. We'll also find out what you, our viewers, have selected thanks to the poll on Motoring's webpage. Now this next category makes a lot of sense to me, station wagons, or wagons as I like to call them these days. I've never understood why anybody would buy, let's say, a BMW X5 with very little room in it instead of a 5 Series touring wagon. Lots of room, looks cool, and drives like a BMW should. Do I have an answer? Absolutely not. But let's join Graham for his nominees in the wagon category. Our best new wagon category, well as Brad said, it makes more sense to buy a wagon than anything else. Without further ado, here's our three nominees, two traditional wagons and one that's been on a steroid program. Why anyone would buy an SUV after driving the 5 Series Touring Wagon is beyond me. 
Not only will it swallow just as much cargo, it actually has a very comfortable compliant ride. Likewise, with an inline six that delivers 255 horsepower and 220 pound-feet of torque under the hood, it manages to haul whenever the driver gets on the gas. Its hallmark, however, is the manner in which it handles a twisty back road. You can romp around corners at silly speeds without the five losing its core. It really is a very together package. As with the sedan and convertible versions, the 93 Sports Combi is aimed at the driver's driver. The base car and its 210 horsepower is good, the aero version is much better, upping the pony count to 250 and adding a very rewarding 258 pound-feet of torque and a six-speed automatic transmission transforms the driving experience. It also brings a healthy dose of flexibility and a maximum cargo volume of 72.3 cubic feet. Indeed, as a package, it makes for a very appealing set of wheels. The B9 Tribeca is an odd duck. On the one hand, it handles very well, manages to deliver a very comfortable ride, and it comes with Subaru's wonderful all-wheel drive system. On the other hand, the engine just does not live up to the B9 sporty promise, and primarily because the horsepower does not turn up for work until very late in the rev range. Likewise, the optional third row seating is pretty much a waste of time. Criticisms aside, however, there is something about the B9 that's lacking in its peers, and that's personality. It goes without saying that our best new wagon of 2006 is the BMW 5 Series Touring. Our next category is pickup trucks, and as we all know, nobody loves pickups like our Bill Gardner. So here's Bill with his nominees for Best Pickup Truck 2006. Brad, this year in the pickup truck category, three contenders. Two heavyweight champs in the ring against a brand new middleweight contender. The two heavyweights, the Lincoln Mark LT ultra plush truck and the big imposing Dodge Ram. And the new kid on the block, the Honda Ridgeline, definitely the middleweight by comparison. The Lincoln Mark LT is, well, the Lincoln of pickup trucks with an ultra plush interior, very smooth ride, and it's easily the quietest truck I've ever driven, bar none. Lincoln was even able to capture that trademark Lincoln look with the unmistakable grille and ample chrome. With the high ride height, the deepest box in the industry, and a tail high stance, you're definitely not loading anything over the sides or over the tailgate unless you're an NBA player. 5.4 liter Triton V8 with three valves per cylinder has definitely got the power at highway speeds. You can feel it wants to hold high gear without unlocking the torque converter, but at low speeds, there's no mistaking the weight and bulk of this truck. It always feels the heavy weight that it really is. 2006 Ram and Ram Mega Cab retains and grows the big, bold, in-your-face, big rig styling that Dodge brought to the pickup truck segment with the 1994 Ram. The big news with the 06 Ram pickups is in the cab and under the hood. The Mega Cab bows in with by far the biggest crew cab in the business. At 9 foot 3 inches fore to aft, it's 15 inches longer than the average crew cab. The 345 horsepower 5.7 liter Hemi V8 gets MDS, multiple displacement system, a cylinder deactivation system that allows it to cruise on four cylinders under light load for an advertised fuel savings of up to 20%. The 06 Ram is the first pickup to use cylinder deactivation and with buckle-liter fuel you can bet it won't be the last. The Honda Ridgeline is the new kid on the block and while Honda took a long time to enter the pickup market, they sure turned some heads once they unveiled their first ever pickup. The first and only pickup truck with a unibody frame where the cab, box and frame are one integrated unit. The first and only pickup with independent rear suspension produces the best ride and handling ever in a pickup truck. The two-way tailgate and lockable underfloor storage are huge strides in terms of utility and a great way to claw back some of the cargo space you give up in a crew cab short box pickup. The 3.5 liter variable valve timing V6 has good power, a nice exhaust note, and even when you're driving the wheels off at fuel economy the others can't match. Top it off with all-wheel drive on all models and you've got a sure-footed, comfortable, practical truck 
and our motoring 2006 truck of the year. Kenzie's Corner with Jim Kenzie. The best thing about being Canadian is not maple syrup, it's not the RCMP, and it's not the ability to complain to your government in two official languages. The best thing about being Canadian is that we don't have to put up with this. This thing is called a motorized passive restraint. It's a type of device that's mandated by the United States government because Americans are too stupid to wear their seatbelts and the governments are too chicken to force them to do so. Now, why do I hate passive restraints? Well, let me count the ways. First of all, if you want to back up, you open the door to see where you're going, and the seatbelt comes and it strangles you. If you're in a hurry to get out of your car, you're late for a meeting or something, you open the door and you get out of the car and you run right into the little mouse. But the worst possible thing is when you're in that hurry, you grab your briefcase, you try to get out of the car, and the briefcase gets hung up on the seatbelt. And there's another aspect of these belts which I don't like. When you close the door, the shoulder belt attaches itself, but you still have the lap belt, which you must attach actively. The problem there is that once this belt's attached, you tend to think that you're safe, and you don't use your lap belt. So far, the only car available in Canada that has these type of seat belts is called the Ford Probe. Is uh, Ford a sponsor? No. Okay. Ford, you should be ashamed of yourself. This is Jim Kenzie from Motoring 90. We're back at the Docks Entertainment Center in Toronto. It won't be long before Julie and Jennifer will be pulling the rafts off Motoring's overall Car of the Year for 2006. We'll also find out who you, the viewers, have selected. You know, as we all know, Graham, for the past several years, sport utilities have almost had a status symbol. I mean, I've seen some of the older guys at the golf course getting rid of their Sevilles and getting into a Cadillac Escalade. But still, for some, SUV is a dirty word. Well, it may be for some, but you know what? For the manufacturers, it most certainly isn't because this year there was such a large crop of SUVs, we ended up having to divide them, as we did with sports sedans, into two separate categories, those under $40,000 and those over. Precious few things in life are perfect. The previous generation Ford Explorer was not among them. Aside from its tire troubles, it had been left on the vine too long and so had fallen way behind an ever-improving pack. Enter the 2006 model. It has one of the nicest interiors offered, SUV or not, has the cargo capacity demanded and thanks to a stiffer frame, a solid platform for the fully independent suspension. It also comes with much better power, especially if you opt for the 4.6 litre V8 engine. The original Sportage remains one of the worst vehicles I've ever tested. The 2006 Sportage, however, has absolutely nothing in common with it. It now has style, good road manners, ample power and plenty of usable flexibility. It also comes with a decent four-wheel drive system that tames unwanted wheel spin, although the lack of a low-range gear set does limit off-road ability. However, its ace in the hole is price. It starts at a little over $21,000 and tops out at less than 30 large. Back in 1971, Suzuki invented the Mini Ute segment. Over the years, its offerings were then swamped with competitors like the Honda CRV and Toyota RAV4. Through it all, Suzuki persevered. The latest Grand Vitara finally gives the company something it's always needed, and that's a contender. The Grand Vitara is large enough to be functional, handles well, has plenty of power and flexibility, and if you opt for the range-topping Leatherline JLX model, it comes with a low-range gear set and so delivers a ton of off-road ability. Our best new SUV under $40,000? Well, it was a no-brainer in picking the Suzuki Grand Vitara. At one time, GM tacked the SS moniker onto just about any vehicle without ever doing anything other than adding the two letters. It was a futile effort aimed at hoodwinking punters into thinking the SS derivative was something special. Well, that was then and this is now. The SS Trailblazer is true to its hot rod roots. From its 6-litre, 395-horsepower Corvette-inspired engine to its sportier chassis, suspension and 20-inch wheels, 
this thing defies description. It handles a racetrack almost as well as a true sports sedan and yet comes with the versatility and flexibility the Trailblazer is famous for. It really is a refreshing change and one for the good. Having tarted and retarted the Discovery, Land Rover finally decided to get real when it launched the LR3. While it is just as good in the dirt as the old Disco, the new vehicle boasts a logical interior layout, a ton of equipment, much better road manners and decent power. Its bold, rather boxy look also means it stands out in the upscale SUV crowd. That said, it also proved to be one of the biggest disappointments. The test drive started with potential only to fizzle out and fade into memory. What a pity. As is the case with many manufacturers, Mercedes-Benz first attempt at an SUV proved to be rather disappointing. The 2006 ML takes all of the disappointments and addresses them and then some. It now uses unibody construction rather than the old body on frame. It has all the electronic bells and whistles demanded and the power and panache to carry the MB nameplate proudly. For the magnitude of the improvements, the latest ML easily wins Motoring's award for best new SUV over $40,000. On previous shows, I've talked about some of the challenges facing the domestic makers, primarily the amount of money they have to spend in medical and pension costs. But there's something else they've got to worry about. Generally speaking, General Motors' problem is efficiency and quality. So part of the solution, as announced recently by their chairman, they're going to close their most efficient, most productive, highest quality plant. Oh, I don't understand that. Now, maybe the fact that it's in Canada might have something to do with it. You wouldn't think that they would make a decision based on international politics now, would you? When we come back, it's time to unveil our overall best vehicle for the year 2006. Stay with us. We're back at the Docks Entertainment Center in Toronto, and now it's time for Jennifer and Julie to pull the wraps off Motoring's pick as best overall vehicle for 2006. Before we do that though, as usual, Jim Kenzie would like to be heard first. Some years, there's an obvious car of the year, and usually Brad and Graham don't pick it. This year, I don't think there is one obvious choice. There are a couple of spectacular cars within their categories. We've already talked about the Corvette Z06, unbelievable car. Now some people might think is it worth $20,000 more than a regular Corvette? My answer to that is it's $150,000 cheaper than anything that competes with it. We've also mentioned the Hyundai Sonata, very very fine car. But I think this year's car of the year has got to be more than just a car. In one guise it's a high performance sport coupe. In another guise it's a very economical, efficient, and attractive family sedan. And in a third, guys, it's one of the greenest cars you can buy. So the car of the year this year is three cars of the year, the family known as the Honda Civic. Well, another interesting choice, Jim. As is our time-honored tradition, in order for the car to win the overall car of the year, it must have won its category. So let's recap our category winners. Our economy car of the year was the Honda Civic. In the family car category, the Hyundai Sonata pipped the Ford Fusion to the post. The sports sedan under 40K, well, it was a no-brainer. The Subaru WRX and its much more meaty cousin, the STI. In the sports sedan over $40,000, well, again, another no-brainer, the BMW 3 Series. In the sports coupe, a world-class car in the form of the Chevrolet Z06. Our best new convertible was the Mazda MX-5. Quite simply stated, it was just too much for the Pontiac Solstice. In the luxury car category, the Dodge Charger SRT8 whipped the others and picked up the honours. Best new crossover vehicle went to the Mazda 5. Again, another simple choice. 
Our Wagon of the Year goes to the BMW 5 Series, primarily for its sporting utility. Our best new SUV under $40,000 goes to the Suzuki Grand Vitara. Once an oddball, it's now very much mainstream. In the SUV category over $40,000, well, it was a cakewalk, a Mercedes-Benz all-new ML class. Last but not least, Bill's Choice's best new pickup of the year, the Honda Ridgeline. And so we get to the whole point of this hour-long extravaganza. And for once, well, Jim Kenzie managed to get it right. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you our car of the year, the Honda Civic. The Honda Civic sedan is going to rewrite the entry-level rulebook. Move up the ladder and you'll find a sporty coupe and its frenetic twin, the Civic Si. And for those with an environmental bent, well, there's the Civic Hybrid. In short, one nameplate, a world of choice. Well, Graham, as you can see, our viewers have also chosen the Honda Civic as the car of the year. Well, we want to congratulate Honda and all our category winners, and we want to thank you, our viewers, some of whom were not even born when we came to air in the fall of 1987. Thanks for watching. We couldn't do it without you. That's it for now. We'll see you next week as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Collecting is a disease. It's not curable, but you can treat it by finding a nice object somewhere that you don't have and drag it home. TSN's Motoring 2006 has been brought to you by the new Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses.